Good morning again. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On this all too hot day, we come to the sanctuary and give thanks for air conditioning. Your tithes and offerings help keep it cool in here. So keep them coming, y'all. Thank you for that. We want to welcome, if you're visiting with us for the first time or a guest, we're so glad that you're here. And we want to welcome especially those who are worshiping by radio or by Facebook Live. And we pray that they have an experience of worship wherever they are. Would you bow for our invocation? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. This morning cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name especially in this hour of worship. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.
both Beth and Barbara, and I know you've enjoyed so much what they've done for us in July and August, playing together. It's just been a joy. Stand with me now for our opening hymn, I Stand Amazed in the Presence, 371. We'll sing one, two, and four.
morning, everyone. We've got lots of friends with us here today, some for the first time that we're so happy to see. How's school going? Good, 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 bad. That's what I heard. They gave you a science project the first week. How dare them? How awful, man. It's rough when school makes you actually do school stuff, right? Well, I have a question, and I want you to pretend with me here. Okay, so pretend like you're holding a glass of water. Warren, where's your glass of water? Bentley, okay, you got yours. All right, now stretch your arm out straight. Pretend like your elbow did not work. Can you drink? Could you drink that water? Nope, you can't bend your elbow. Can you get it? Do you think it's it? Okay, can you guarantee that it's not going to spill everywhere? Okay, just because you have your wrist doesn't mean you can get it up to your mouth. Right? Your wrist may move, but you still can't. Yeah? I was going to bring everyone a bottle of water, but then I thought, uh, everybody's going to be drenched, right, Benson? Well, do you think that that elbow is important? Yes. You, you can't get something accurately and without making a mess straight to your mouth. You could get someone else could help you. Uh, that had an elbow right, you could maybe modify it, but it's just easier when you have all your parts of your body working the right way together, right? Okay, if your other elbow works, you could use that arm, but y'all, they're too, they're too, I can't do this with them apparently, This these kids. Well, just, just think about this. Everyone in this church is part of the body of Christ. Do you hear you hear that saying a lot? We're part of the body of Christ. Everyone here is. What what does that mean to you? Anything? Does it make sense to you to say that we're part of the body of Christ? Yes, kind of, maybe not really thought about it before. Well, think about it. Just like our arms and our hands, our legs and our elbows are important to our body, we are important to the body of Christ. Just because our body parts help us do special things, being part of the body of Christ, we can help by doing special things for God. Think about it. What are some special talents that you have? Maybe, if, oh, Swayze, what's your special talent? Sawyer? Oh, um, okay, so tumbling and contortionist. Oh, okay. She can twist very easily, I guess. She's very limber. What? Um, some of you are really good at talking to other people. Some of you can make friends easily, right? Some of you like to sing. Ferris can talk to anybody that walks up to her, right? So we have people in our church that like um, music. They like doing things tech-wise, like they like to do stuff on the computer or with sound. We have people who are very good at remembering other people, so they remember to pray for them, even though some of us may forget. We have some people that like to work with kids and some people that like to work with youth, some people that like to work with older adults, and all those people are special for our body of Christ. God's given each of us a gift to work with and to use all for his glory because if there was nobody that wanted to work with kids what would happen y'all wouldn't have anything to do at church would you would you want to come to church if nobody wanted to hang out and play with y'all no no we all have these special gifts that God's given us and we're to use those gifts and I know you may not know already as a kid what your special gift that God's given you is But as you grow up, you'll find things that interest you and things that you like. And you can use those gifts to glorify God. Right, Harper? Right now she's worried about a sucker. So this week, this is what I want you to do. Here's your homework. Are you ready? Think about some of the stuff that you like to do. Maybe you like to play ball or you like to talk to friends or um, you like to sing Think about those things that you like to do, and I want you to think about how you can bring glory to God by using those gifts that God's given you. You think you can do that? Finley, Ferris, can you do it? 
Finley's saying she can. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the gifts that you've given us. Help us to do the things that we're good at to help the church grow stronger so that more people can learn about you. In your name we pray. Amen. children. Some of our children will dismiss to the nursery and some of them will stay here and worship. We're glad for either one of those. Every five weeks or so, we pause and have a mission moment about a ministry here at the church. And I'm so glad that this morning, Sarah Russell is going to talk to us about Wonderful Wednesdays. Okay, so today's mission moment is about our Wonderful Wednesdays at Wesley, also known as WWW. This program, um, which I'm sure has changed throughout the years, began approximately in 1984. That means it's 39 years old and still going strong. This program is unique in that we are one of the only churches that I'm aware of that picks up um, the children from school. And by doing this, by picking up the children from school, we're able to reach a variety of children in our area. Our church tries to adhere to the safe sanctuary policy, which is a set of guidelines the United Methodist Church has created to operate children and youth programs in a safe environment. That being said, we need volunteers. Last year, we had 80 children registered with us on Wednesdays. That's eight, zero, 80 children um, coming here on Wednesdays. Um, and Kelly said that even more would ask her at school, like, hey, do you go to that church that has the Wednesday programs? They were wanting to come to our church, and what a blessing that is for us. Um, according to Safe Sanctuary, we need one adult to every eight children to provide small group lessons. Small groups will create a more personal conversation and lesson for these children. We pick up children at the primary school around three. The elementary children walk over shortly after that, and parents pick them up at five. That's two hours that our church has the opportunity to reach the children of our community. We pro provide a snack, the children play on the playground, and then children break off into groups for a Bible lesson. If you aren't able to commit to every Wednesday, let us know what you can do. We will work with whatever time and or ability that you have. Um, please just come and volunteer. We do not want to turn away children. We have the opportunity to plant the seed of Christ in these children. Our first WWW will be August 30th, and contact Kelly if you feel led to, uh, to serve in this great ministry. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. And there is a bulletin insert where you can uh, fill it out to be a volunteer for Wonderful Wednesdays. There's a training a week from today immediately following church. And I would invite you to at least come to the training and see if this is something where you might be uh, able to share your gifts and graces in mission and ministry for the children of our community. We pause now to give our prayers to our good and gracious God who knows our heart before we speak a word and who is already hard at work on things we know nothing of. If you look on the back of your bulletin, you'll see folks that we are in prayer for on a regular basis. There are a couple of new names there, so I would draw your attention to that. And let us uh, most certainly remember uh, Lahaina uh, in Maui and also Hurricane Hillary that's coming in uh, now on the West Coast. Knowing that God has remembered what we have forgotten, hard at work on all other things, we pause for a moment of silence as we prepare to go to God in prayer. Will you bow with me at this time? Holy, holy, holy Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Gracious and loving God, we recite these words at each communion service. And we know that they aren't meant to be lived by just once a month, but rather each day of our lives. Today we are careful to give you all praise, honor, and glory. We give thanks that you are a God who gives freely and never rescinds the gifts given, never revokes them. Gifts of love and redemption, mercy and compassion. Days go by and the busyness of our lives causes us to forget these free gifts. But we gather in worship that we might be reminded that you set us aside in our mother's womb and gave to us our precious Redeemer, Jesus Christ. As we gather this morning, Lord, we remember the suffering from the fires of Lahaina. We remember once upon a time our own great challenges with Hurricane Katrina, and we offer prayers of rescue and comfort for those in California and beyond in the path of Hurricane Hillary. We give thanks that you are the God of gentle breezes and mighty storms, and will not leave those forsaken who are facing danger now. We confess, O oh God, that we have failed to be an obedient people. Even in the face of your free gift of love, we often stumble on the path to righteousness. Thank you so much for understanding our humanity and never abandoning us even when we abandon you. Help us, Lord, to love you more perfectly and to love one another as you would have us to love one another. This morning we have named prayers in writing, on our lips, and in our hearts. And now in your mercy, we beseech you to hear these prayers of your people as we lift them in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our death, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is number 362, Nothing But the Blood. Let's stand together and sing all four stanzas.
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. May our morning offering be an act of gratitude given from a merciful heart. We continue our worship with God's tithes and our offerings. for generosity. We dedicate these now in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
give thanks each Sunday for our lay readers, and this morning I give thanks for Stephanie Pope, who brings the word from Romans. The scripture lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 11, verses 12 and 29 through 32. Now, if their stumbling means riches for the world, and if their loss means riches for Gentiles, how much more will their, will their full inclusion mean? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient, disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so also have they now been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Each Sunday as I prepare to, to preach, one of the things that I seek to do, and I'm not convinced I do a very good job of it, but is to encourage us to come closer to living in the image and likeness of God. Because regardless of the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, an epistle lesson, a psalm, at the end of the day, isn't this we who have been created in God's image, isn't this what we are called to do? To live in a closer likeness to our creator, our good and gracious creator. Sometimes that means I, I stretch things a little bit, but I hope not too much. And I hope this morning that that's the word of encouragement you receive from this lesson from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Would you bow with me? And now, almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, only one more Sunday in Romans after today. If you're getting a little tired of the letter to the church at Rome, fear not. You've just got one more Sunday. We've taken a long look, a deep dive into some of Paul's more challenging passages to the church at Rome. Challenging to that church, and I hope what we've learned, challenging to this church as well. He wrote so beautifully in this letter. One of the cornerstones for contemporary theology. He wrote so beautifully and so openly, and it's a shame that he never got to visit Rome after he sent this letter. It makes the letter all the more precious. And we've learned over the past few weeks that he's really addressing three different communities of folks. He's, he's addressing the Israelites who follow the law but do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. He is addressing the Israelites who follow the law and do accept Jesus as the Messiah, and they think they're kind of special because of that. And then finally, he is addressing the Gentiles who did not follow the law at all and accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Now, in the book of Romans, when Paul refers to the law or the scripture, he's referring to the Tanakh. That's your 25-cent word for today, Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K-H. And that means he's referring to the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he uses it to make his point to the Jews of Rome and to share it openly with the Gentiles who might refer to it, the law, but certainly do not have to follow it in order to know salvation. Today's passage makes a lot more sense if we uh, read a couple of the earlier verses. And I want you to hear the passage again, only this time from Peterson's The Message. As you recall, it kind of makes it plain and folksy. So here's the way Peterson translates this passage. The next question is, are they down for the count? Are they out of this for good? 
And the answer is a clear-cut no. Ironically, when they walked out, they left the door open and the outsiders walked in. But the next thing you know, the Jews were starting to wonder if perhaps they had walked out on a good thing. Now, if their leaving triggered this worldwide coming of non-Jewish outsiders to God's kingdom, just imagine the effect of their coming back. What a homecoming. I want to lay all this out on the table as clearly as I can, friends. This is complicated. It would be easy to misinterpret what's going on and arrogantly assume that your royalty, and they're just rabble, out on their ears for good, but that's not it at all. This hardness on the part of insider Israel toward God is temporary. Its effect is to open things up to all the outsiders so that we end up with a full house. Before it's all over, there will be a complete Israel. As it is written, a champion will stride down from the mountain of Zion and he'll clean house in Jacob. And this is my commitment to my people removal of their sins. From your point of view, as you hear and embrace the good news of the message, it looks like the Jews are God's enemies, but looked at from the long-range perspective of God's overall purpose, they remain God's oldest friends. God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty, never canceled, never rescinded. There was a time not so long ago when you were on the outs with God, but then the Jews slammed the door on him and things opened for you. Now they are on the outs, but with the door held wide open for you, they have a way back in. In one way or another, God makes sure that we all experience what it means to be outside so that God can personally open the door and welcome us back in. Powerful. Remember from last week we said that Jewish Christians in Rome were treating the Gentiles as if they were second-class citizens because they were not quote-unquote chosen as were the Jews and because they did not follow the law or receive the law through Moses as did the Jews. And so what was happening, as you recall, is that they were using the law, the Tanakh, to create division and distinctions between believers. But Paul says that in Christ there is no distinction, that God, because of Christ, sees no distinctions in any of us, that in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile. In Christ all are welcome at the table. And I used that passage to ask this question last week, a question about who we might exclude from our own worship if given the opportunity. I asked us to dig deep and ask the question of ourselves, who do we think doesn't belong here? And of course the answer is that everyone belongs in the house of God, the church, for worship, for praise and thanksgiving, fellowship, and most especially for redemption. We don't get to exclude anyone because just as Paul pointed out to the church at Rome, there are no distinctions in Christ. And today there are still no distinctions. He loves us all equally. We don't exclude anyone because just as Paul pointed out, there are no distinctions. And God bestows, as is in the word today, God bestows gifts on all equally believers and non-believers. The door is open wide that all may come in, Paul says. Romans eleven twenty nine says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable. If God can do that for us, can we not do that for others? Irrevocable, or as Peterson says, never canceled, never rescinded. Even though we fall away, God does not fall away. Y'all have heard me say that a hundred times. 
But in our everyday, ordinary life, we can have things revoked, can't we? You get too many speeding tickets, you get your license revoked. Don't pay our dues to the Rotary or miss too many meetings, we have our membership revoked. Sometimes in a marriage where our love is to be irrevocable, one partner or the other will change their mind and revoke their love, sometimes giving it to someone else. Parents who discover they have a child that doesn't live within the parent's understanding of what is right and wrong sometimes revoke their love from that child. Many a young man or woman have come out to their parents as gay only to be told, you don't belong anymore, you're no longer a part of this family, go away and don't come back. But in Christ, love is unconditional. And yet some people know what it feels like to have a parent's love revoke from them. And yet that child never stops being the son or daughter. Once the son or daughter, always, we might as well keep them in the fold of love. And sadly, the converse is true, too. Sometimes children become outdone with their parents and proclaim loudly, I hate you. They leave home and become estranged from those parents, revoking their love. Those are hard situations. So we, most of us, have an experience of some level of having something given to us and then taken away again. In this temporary human world, we all know examples where things have been revoked, taken away, and sometimes that thing is love. But here's the thing. We're made in God's image. Okay, that's from the beginning. That's right there in Genesis. We are made in God's image. And that means that we've got the capacity to behave like God. We can't be God. That's not what I'm saying. But being made in the image and likeness of God, we have the capacity to put on the image and likeness of God in this temporary human world. I know the bar is set high to do that, but guess what? Jesus died on the cross, and there's no bar any higher than that one. Can we do it? We can do it because we are made in God's image, and that empowers us to the possibility of irrevocable love, just as has been bestowed upon us. And when we give a gift, we don't get to take it back. Paul said that God gave gifts and placed a calling on Jew and Gentile alike and that God would never revoke those gifts, never take them back. The Jew or the Gentile may come into Christ's presence or not, but that gift is never revoked, not canceled, not rescinded, because that's who our God is and that's the image in which we're made. It's hard work, y'all. We can't be God, that's not what I'm saying, but we have the capacity to be like God. When we give a gift, we don't take it back. In reference to salvation for the Gentiles and for the Jews, the Jews for that matter, Paul asked this question. He asked, have they stumbled so as to fall? Have they stumbled so as to fall? In other words, what he's saying, we all stumble. Falling implies permanent damage or rejection. And Paul's answer to the question, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. Or as Peterson puts it, the next question is, are they down for the count? Are they out of this for good? And the answer is a clear cut, no. There is room for Jew and Gentile in the household of God. 
there's room for a lot of folks in the household of God. And when we cross that threshold into the kingdom one day, we may be a little surprised at who we find to keep company with for life eternal. In the verses that immediately precede the ones that were read today, Paul uses the metaphor of an olive tree. He says the farmer plants the tree and it has one root. But the farmer has some natural branches and then does some grafting of other branches. Is one better than the other, the natural branch or the grafted branch? In the end, don't, don't they both produce fruit? One root, one root. God, our creator, and Christ, our Lord, supporting both natural and grafted branches, Jew and Gentile. And think about who else in this 21st century field of faith has been grafted into the tree. It's a lot of different folks. God's roots go deep and know no boundaries. Then it was Jew and Gentile. Who is it today? Because God loves no boundaries, so who is it today that is included within that great fold? Finally, Paul goes on to say in verses 30 and 32, just as you were once disobedient to God but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, now this is a confusing sentence to me, so also they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also now received mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Let me say that again. God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that God may be merciful to all. God has imprisoned all. Not only does God revoke, not revoke God's mercy, but it is available to all so that he may be merciful to all. We've all stumbled, amen? We have all stumbled and we'll stumble again, but not so as to fall by no means, but through our stumbling salvation has come. Ours is a God of second chances. And the gifts God gave in Christ and the call to follow Christ is never revoked, rescinded, or canceled, never taken away, and falls on each of us equally. I, I think I'm repeating myself every single Sunday uh, here in the book of Romans, but this is what Paul is trying to get through to the church at Rome. And now today, by extension, get through to us too. And the gifts God gave in Christ and the call to follow Christ is never revoked and never taken away and falls on each of us equally. On our best days, we receive that gift and we answer that call, don't we? On our best days, we receive the gift and answer that call. And when we stumble, as we inevitably will do, God surrounds us in mercy until we can stand upright again. When we stumble, as we inevitably will do, God surround us, surrounds us in mercy till we can stand again. Are we down for the count? Are we out for good? The answer is a clear-cut no. That is God's irrevocable love for us. That is who God is. May we live in the image and likeness of God, and may we love one another as God has loved us. Will you bow with me? 
We give thanks to you, almighty God, for second chances. We give thanks that when we stumble, there is a hand of mercy that reaches out that we might take hold and stand up again. It may take us a while to reach for that hand, but God, you never take it away. And just as you extend the hand of mercy to us, help us to know that it is now our time to extend that hand of mercy to others. We all have an experience of having had something taken away from us, and we know how that can hurt and be painful. But you, O oh God, in Christ are the great uniter. And so in this word, Unite us today, we pray, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Each Sunday, we issue the invitation, and the invitation is this. If you've never dedicated your life to Christ, we want you to come forward while we're singing this last hymn and be welcomed. Or if you need to hit the reset button and rededicate your life to Christ, come forward and be welcomed. Maybe you would like to unite with this congregation of the United Methodist Church and become a member. Come forward as we sing and be welcomed. And know always that this prayer rail is open for you to come and have a moment of prayer before we go forth this day. You're welcome for that as well. Our closing hymn is Grace Greater Than Our Sin. 365. Let's stand together as we sing one and three. questions of being loyal to the United Methodist Church and faithful to this congregation with her prayers, her presence, her gifts, service, and witness. And she said, I will. She transfers her membership from First Baptist Church. And now it's my duty to ask you, will you renew your commitment to be loyal to the United Methodist Church and to support this congregation with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? And will you support Joanne in her journey of faith with First United Methodist Church? Very good. 
And now may God the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, and the uniting power of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each of you this day and each day of your lives. We go in peace, and God be with us until we meet again. Amen. Amen.